But in terms of, you know, sin that wraps itself around us and, and, and sometimes, you know, not, not sometimes, every time if sin's there, it will trip people up unless people deal with it. Uh, it will drown people and hold them down until you kick this thing off and get rid of it. So lay aside every weight and the sin that so easily besets uh, one translation says. And you know, then there's the whole area of the expectations of other people. Um, and why are we uh, talking about that is because everybody's got a plan for your life. Everybody that knows you has got a plan somehow. And, uh, you know, it says, let us run with patience the particular race that God has set before us. God's got a race for you and God's got a race for me. So I can't run your race and you can't run my race. We can encourage each other each to run the race that God set before us. But sometimes people's expectations uh, is like unbelievable. Do this, do that, and, and run here, run there. It's, it's, listen, God's given me a race and I need to run that. I can't run your race or the one that you try to impose on me. All right, so we need to run the race that God set before us. And... Uh, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's certainly not, not uh, unrealistic that people would expect us, have expectations on us if they're in our family, friends and church family and so forth. We have expectation that we are kind people, that we deal with things properly and all of these things. That's normal and that's understandable and that's, that's perfectly acceptable. But then when people try to impose their plan on your life and God's already got a plan for you, you need to reject that plan. All right? You need to run the particular race that God said before you. So that's the first point. We simplify our life. Uh, clean out the old clutter. Um, and uh, one day... Um, one day I will get some time to go through my devices and delete some of the apps that I've got on that have been sitting on there and they're updating every couple of weeks and they're just sitting there sometimes for months uh, and, and I don't use them. So that's what I'm talking about, uncluttering, getting rid of some of these things. Number two, second point, don't get impatient or in a hurry. Don't get impatient or in a hurry. <laughs> so, so what that means is that a marathon runner requires patience. Um, and uh, you can't be at the starting line, do three steps, and then think, oh, are we there yet? You know, like, how do you remember when, you know, if you've got kids and you take them for a ride, and, oh, gosh, we used to travel to Auckland with our kids uh, sort of quite frequently in the early days when they were small, and we just put them in the car, and sometimes at a moment's notice, say, look, we've got three days off, let's go. So we travel one day up, spend the day up there, and spend the next day traveling back, just so the kids could see the cousin. And, you know, we're up the road here, and we're barely up the Hayward, so... And the kids say, are we there yet? <laughs> well, no, we're not there yet. Uh, and then, you know, I would say, are we having fun yet? <laughs> so we play I Spy with my little eye and keep the kids busy and do what you can. And uh, so, friend, don't get impatient uh, or in a hurry. Uh, this is one of the issues uh, that sometimes people, if they want to become long-distance runners, many times people don't know how to pace themselves. The, the speed that we determine... Uh, needs to be sustainable. It's, it's not uncommon for an inexperienced person to, you know, at the, at the start of the race, uh, and just go, I'm going to get ahead of the pack like right within the first 500 meters, you know, and they're running a marathon of, uh, uh, was it 42 kilometers or something. Within 500 meters, they need to be at the top of the pack, and, and then, and then, and then uh, seven, eight Ks down the road, they're lying down. They, they can't run anymore. It's just not sustainable. It's all too much. So, you know, the really experienced one, they will set a pace, to begin with, and that's the same pace that they keep on running with, and they're just moving towards the goal because they know that the energy needs to last them right through to the end, to the goal, uh, to the finishing line. I remember a number of years ago, uh, I was working up near the Mount uh, Ruapehu, Mount Narahoe, you know, that um, volcano that we've got up there. And a couple of us decided uh, that we was going to climb up Mount, Mara, Na, Mount Narahoe. Uh, this is winter time, and we were going to climb up and then ski down. And we had a an, an mountaineer guy with us uh, from Austria that had grown up in the mountain. He was a mountain climber. He was, uh, you know, like uh, trekking and tramping. That was just his thing. The whole outdoors and everything. And um, 
I grew up in the hills, uh, so I, 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 I didn't relate to what, 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 what he was doing, but I said, I'm going to come up with you. So we grabbed the skis and got our gears, and we climbed up there. And pretty soon in the, in the early start, he says, look, he says, just always put one foot in front of another. Don't get in a hurry. He says, we've got a long way to go. We left when it was dark, and we got not quite to the top because it wasn't just Snow going up, further up, it got very icy and just very exposed up there and what have you. And so we never got to the top. But gosh, it took a long way to get up and we were down like real quick. And there's a whole story around that. Uh, but anyway, look, he said, look, is that just one foot in front of another? He always walked at the same pace. Just always. Don't, don't think you've got to just suddenly dash, you know, make a dash and you're going to wear yourself out. Just, just one foot in front of another. And I always remember that. And, you know, running a marathon is like that in our Christian life is like that, just one foot in front of another. Um, sometimes we might even lose sight of things in regards to what are we supposed to do? Oh, look, just put one foot in front of another. It'll become clearer as we go. Um, run with patience, Hebrews 12, uh, verse 1 in the second part. Uh, let us run with patience the particular race that God has set before us. Friend, in the Christian life, in terms of maturity, there's no such thing as instant maturity. Growth takes time. You know, nowadays we've got instant coffee, we've got instant mashed potatoes, we've got instant meals, microwave things. So just everything is instant, everything is quick. And because a lot of that stuff that's instant is actually not good for us, so it's good to stay away from it. Uh, all right. But you see, we need to realize that God's never in a hurry. You know, somebody said once, you can choose to be a mushroom or you can choose to be an oak tree. A mushroom will grow overnight. Like, gosh, that, poof, this thing will just puff up. But, you know, you pull it up, and within three days, it's wilted and gone again. Whereas a, an oak tree takes years uh, to grow. And I remember when uh, in one of the houses, our first home that Vanessa and I lived in, we had a huge back backyard and a couple of oak trees, uh, huge. And this thing is forever shedding these uh, seeds. What do you call it? Oak um, acorns and, and dropping down and gosh you've got to be quick to pull them up because they will take roots very, root very quickly and then every now and then you see a little plant come up and it's about yay big and so, oh here's another little oak tree you try to yank this thing up you know for this much growth there's this much root under there it's unbelievable uh, so that's why you've got to be quick to scoop them off otherwise they'll turn into trees and uh and uh and yet the actual growth of the oak tree to get to the size that it is takes multiplied years and so we can choose to be a mushroom uh, or we can choose to be an oak tree. Just put one foot in front of another and just grow a little bit every day, a little bit every week. You know, maturity is spelled T-I-M-E. It means time. You know, each week we take a couple of steps forward. Each week we, we apply what we've learned uh, through the preaching and what we've picked up in our reading of the Word and, and in our devotional. We put that in and each week and eventually we will be like big and strong oak trees. And, you know, one thing I've discovered with oak trees, you know, sometimes, uh, you know, we got different forests uh, back in the country where I was born and raised. And, you know, sometimes a few trees get knocked over um, with storms and stuff that goes on. And, but it's never an oak tree. Never an oak tree. Their root system is amazing. And we can choose to be oak trees. That even if the storms of life blow, uh, you know, and then we develop, oak tree even got flexibility. When it blows this way, it leans a bit. And when it blows that way, it leans that, uh, that a little bit, but it never snaps. And you and I, we need to have flexibility. We need to have some give in us. Uh, sometimes people that are very rigid and very, oh, you know, we can't compromise and we cannot move. Well, you yeah, develop a bit of flex. You know, somebody said once, the blessed are the flexible, for they shall not be broken. Now, don't ask me to find that reference uh, in the Bible. <laughs> it's actually not there. It's just somebody saying. But I thought it's a good one. All right. So, uh, get, uh, don't get impatient or in a hurry with your spiritual growth. Be patient with yourselves. Uh, it's been said that babies double in weight in the first year. It's amazing how a baby can grow so quickly and then, you know, they still grow. And, but how many you know of you are glad that you're not doubling in size now every year? I mean, I mean wouldn't that be terrible? You know, we can fill this whole room by ourselves. Uh, and uh, and so, so sometimes we can't see the growth in ourselves after a while. It's like, oh, am I growing? But other people can see it as we become more Christ-like 
people can see it. And, and so that's why it's good. We get into our small group and we encourage each other. Look, I see great things and, you know, I see this and I see that. And, and sometimes people see things in our lives that we can't see ourselves. So be patient. Number three, spend time focusing on Jesus every day. Every day. You know, we talk about a quiet time. We talk about a God time. We talk about spending time with God, having a devotional time. Call it what you like. It really is all towards the same purpose that, you know, in the end, we become like those we are close to and like those we spend most of our time with. Um, and when we draw close to God every day, spend time with God every day in our God time, in our quiet time, in our devotional time, we become more and more like Jesus. And that's the whole thing we're discussing today uh, that we have been called to become. And the whole point here is that we are called to become like Jesus. All right, so here we go. In Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, we're still in the same passage here. It says, we do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus. Keep your eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. All right, so the whole deal here is that, uh, that uh, we become like Jesus as we look at Jesus. And so if you're not already in the habit of having a quiet time, I'd really encourage you to set some time aside every day. And I guess uh, our whole thrust during the 40 days in reading our devotional is really in a sense developing a habit, developing a pattern that you really you want to keep going, that you draw aside from the busyness of life and just you and God and, uh, and, and, and spend some time reading the Word, uh, spend some time talking to God and then get real quiet and listen to God and let Him speak to you. Uh, quiet time is sometimes, uh, you know, the term is used that we learn to be quiet before the Lord. You know, Jesus said, he says, when you do your praying, he says, don't be like hypocrites that run around and ring the bells in the streets. And, you know, they say their prayers and they got the religious clothing on and they all draw attention to yourself. No, he says, you, he says, when, when you pray, he says, go into your, into your room and close the door. And that closing the door is not even so much a physical thing as it is um, close the door to your, to your activity. Close the door even to interruptions from family. Um, you know, it's been said that the mother of the Wesley uh, brothers uh, who, you know, she had a bunch of kids and um, many of them became preachers and she was just an amazing woman. And they were in just this, in this in, you know, this is years ago now, they were in this one room house where she had no other room to go to. So what she did is she, she threw her apron over her head and bowed down and had a quiet time like right then. The kids knew when mom's got her apron over her head, we are not to interrupt her. All right. <laughs> How amazing is that? Uh, so Jesus says, shut the door, and then you pray, and your Father who sees you in secret will reward you openly. So we cannot become like Jesus unless we spend time with Jesus. So the point here is to pick a favorite place or a suitable, uh, a suitable time, uh, and pick a favorite place and try to get into a groove and into the habit there, uh, which will help you in establishing a pattern if you haven't already got one. Mark chapter 1, verse 35, it says, Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up and he left the house and he went off to a solitary place where he prayed. <laughs> all right? And, uh, and of course, all the morning people will say, absolutely, that's what you got to do. But not everybody's a morning person. Some people are evening people, and that's okay too. I remember Brother Hagen used to say that he would burn the midnight candle, and he had studied the word into midnight and beyond. He just wasn't an early riser. So don't let, anybody, don't let anybody squeeze you into their box to say, you must do this, you must do that. Do something that works for you. All right? You find your place. You find your pattern that works for you. But very clearly, Jesus uh, went off to pray to a solitary place. Uh, uh, one translation says a deserted place where he was by himself. Um, and here in Luke chapter 22, verse 39, it says, Jesus went out as usual to the Mount of Olives. And uh, this is now Luke 22. This is towards the end of that book. 
Jesus is about to be captured, about to be crucified, and he's now praying, and he's going through this whole uh, area of, uh, you know, the, the, the devil just harassing him and everything else. And Jesus, in this instant, took his disciples with him, and, and then he, he, he said, look, pray with me. And then he went the stones throw further, and he prayed. And this is the place where he had prayed before when he was in Jerusalem multiple times. He had one place, and he had a, a favorite, a suitable time for him to pray there. And... Uh, he called out to the Lord. So the more time that you spend with God, the more you will change. And it really does come down. Uh, uh, it's not just, uh, you know, it's not just uh, quality or quantity. It's both. You've got to have quality time and, and, and you've, got to, you've got to spend time with God because the thing is the influences of the world can bear down on us. Uh, we spend time in the world uh, and, and, and as it were, you know, listening to every voice and we don't get spent get no time to spend time with God, it's not going to work for us. You know, begin with 10 minutes a day. How, how many of you finding that even doing that devotional reading, take about, what, 15 minutes uh, to read each day and to sort of ponder over it and to take enough time? There is, of course, a devotional reading there, which Pastor Rick Warren's put together, and there's actually scripture in there as well. So you're mulling through the Word, and that's just absolutely a fantastic thing to do. You know, we read the Old Testament, and Moses, the Bible tells us, as Moses, when he was up on the mountain spending time with God, he was there for 40 days and 40 nights. Now, this is unrealistic. If I said you, you must have a quiet time and take 40 days and 40 nights, it's unrealistic. Uh, okay, unless God specifically says to do that, uh, it, it, it's, it's not going to work. But, you know, uh, every day a few minutes, so start with 10 minutes, let it, let it sort of expand out to, to 15, 20 minutes and so forth. Half an hour, it'll absolutely be wonderful. If you've got more time, spend more time. It's fantastic. But do what works works for you, and, but try to add a little extra time. Moses was up there for 40 days, 40 nights, and he was so close to God. He was so, he was so touched by the Spirit of God and so, uh, as it were, so impacted by the presence of God that when he came down, the Bible says, his face shone like that of an angel. God's presence so impacted him and so, so touched him and so filled him. When he came down, they thought he was an angel. And, and, and they were scared of him. Moses, <laughs> we're scared. So the Bible says Moses put a veil over his face because the people couldn't look at him. They were just absolutely terrified. Um, and the uh, funny thing is that when God began to speak to Moses, they'd left Egypt, walked out into the wilderness, crossed the Red Sea, and came to Mount Sinai, uh, also called Mount Horeb. And that was the place where Moses received the Ten Commandments, received all the instructions in regards to how to build the tabernacle of Moses. Uh, and the whole, in fact, God gave him the constitution of the nation of Israel right there in those 40 days. And God says to Moses, Moses says, I want you to come up on the mountain and be there. Come up on the mountain and be there. And one day, I remember, we were sitting in a meeting, and a friend of mine, a minister friend, he got up, and he talked about the busyness of life and of ministry. And he says, oh, God's been speaking to me from this very scripture here, and God's told me to be there. And sometimes people say, oh, what if I get into my quiet time? What, what, what am I supposed to do? Well, actually, the more important thing is to be there rather than the doing of things. Okay, and yes, we obviously do something, but sometimes just sitting there quietly and waiting on God and, and having sort of a quiet time to quieten our mind and to quieten ourselves right down, you know, rather than heart racing or like, oh gosh, I've got to do this, I've got to do that. Just be there, just be there. And Moses was up there. Joshua went with him some distance. And the Bible says Moses was up there for seven days when God called him into the glory cloud and drew him into the glory cloud. The Bible says down at the foot of the mountain, it looked like there was a big cloud and a consuming fire up there. And Moses is up there and he walks into the glory cloud. Um, and, a, and the cloud enveloped him. He's in the presence of God. He's in this bubble. Uh, and God instructed him specifically. He, Moses went up there in Exodus chapter 24, I believe, and it comes out in Exodus chapter 34, 10 chapters later. God's given him the rundown on this is what you're going to build, Moses. This is who you call to be the priests. This is how you dress them. This is how you build the altar. This is how you make the anointing oil. 
detail after detail after detail. See, some of you are in business, and you need to hear detail from God in regards to making your business work. Some of you are in complex uh, job environments. Uh, you need the wisdom of God, and God will give that to you in that quiet place. And, uh, and you know, many times the, the, uh, the, 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 the task is not so much to work harder, but to work smarter, and God helps us to work smart. Um, and Moses is up there, and, uh, and, and when he come down, as I say, his face shone. It's like, you know, later, later on when, when Peter and John went up to the Mount of Transfiguration with Jesus, and he, he was transfigured before their eyes, and, 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 and it was the same thing. There was like this, this transformation that went on because Moses had spent extensive time with God. But the amazing thing is that God says, come up, be there, I'll give you the tablets, with the Ten Commandments and other instructions. So Moses comes down after 40 days and after 40 nights in the presence of God, and God says to him, Moses, get down there, get down there quickly. The people have risen up to play. And, uh, and uh, while Moses is up there having his quiet time for 40 days, 40 nights, the people down below said, oh, Moses, we don't know what's become of this Moses. Uh, Aaron, uh, you lead us, because uh, Aaron was to become the high priest. Um, Moses' brother. Um, and, uh, and, 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 and just, you know, just help us. We, we, we don't know about this Moses, and we don't know about this God that he's talking about. And Aaron says, all right, give me all your gold. So they gave him all the gold, and, uh, and Aaron fashioned the golden calf out of it, which they then danced around and worshipped and sacrificed to. And 40 days, Moses is up there, and God says after 40 days, Moses, get down. Quickly, the people have risen up. They're into idol worship. It's terrible. Get down there quickly. And Moses gets down there, and uh, he's talking with Josh. You know, Josh, and Josh says, oh, what is that noise? And, 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 and he says, no, it's not the noise of war, and, and, and it's not the noise of, uh, oh, they're singing. And sure enough, they're singing, and they're partying, and, 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 and they're dancing around these golden calves like heathen, like pagans would. And Moses comes out, and he sees this thing, and 40 days, 40 nights in the presence of God. You would have think that, uh, that, you know, he'd be fixed up by now. But Moses had a bit of a temper. So the Bible says his anger became hot and he threw down the, the, the two tablets and smashed them. <laughs> and then he got to the people and he says, what are you doing? And he says, Aaron, what are you doing? His brother, you know, the, the two brothers. And Aaron's, you know, Aaron now, crafty making excuses. Oh, it's not my fault. He says, the people said, make us a God. So, so they gave me all the gold. I threw the gold into the fire, and this calf came out. <laughs> oh, yeah, right. Yeah, right. Aaron, how did the calf come out? Was it carried out by people? Did it walk out? Golden calf, did it walk? Uh, or did it come out on the trailer? How did this thing come out? You know, it's just fibs. You know, it's just making stuff up. Uh, no, it's not my fault. And so anyway, so Moses takes the golden calf. He grinds it down to powder, chucks the powder into the water, gold, I suppose, and he made the people drink it. You know, he's a bit of a hard man, this Moses in, in time. But, but the point that I'm trying to make is uh, that uh, you know, he's just been in the presence of God. He comes out and he has a fit of anger. This is not a good situation. But you see, this is the same Moses that God used mightily. And, uh, and you know, we, we, we are growing. We are growing. And this Aaron, who led the people into idol worship, becomes the high priest. So be patient with yourself. If you've been somewhere where you shouldn't have been, you've done something that you shouldn't have done, you said something that you shouldn't have said, be patient and allow the Spirit of God to transform you going forward. In Jesus' name. Awesome. Awesome. 2 Corinthians 3.18. Now, Paul describing that situation there. He talked about that Moses had a veil. He says, always oh, face. And he's pointing out that the people, the Jews, before they turned to Christ, they also got a veil over their head. But it's not so much that the glory doesn't shine out, but the glory doesn't shine in because of that veil. But he says, when you're in Christ, this veil is taken away. And, you know, like sometimes people say, you know, I got saved and I saw the light. Well, <laughs> because the veil's taken away. Spiritual blindness is removed. So... Uh, 2 Corinthians 3.18, so all of us who have had that veil removed can see and reflect the glory of the Lord. 
And the Lord, who is the Spirit, makes us more and more like Him, meaning more and more like Jesus, as we are changed into His glorious image. Isn't that good? It's fantastic. So it says, you see and reflect. See and reflect. You see, whatever we see, often enough and long enough, we will reflect. That's why we don't want to hang out with fools and see their foolish ways, because what we see long enough, we will start to emulate and start to reflect. You know, it's been said that uh, scientists have worked out that there is uh, what they call mirror neurons in our brain that kind of have this effect on us that what we see, uh, it's like, you know, it picks us up and we want to get involved and we want to do uh, if we see that long enough. And there is a, a kind of a deal where it brings forth something. Like, for example, if I were to, if I were to yawn right now, which I won't, but if I did, some of you like, oh, you'd sound like, feel like yawning as well, even though you hadn't thought about it before. If, if I were to take a lemon right in front of you, um, you know, yellow big lemon, and I cut it in half and I were to squeeze it, some of you saliva glands would just turn on and start working like really hard out uh, because that's those, those uh, mirror neurons. They just, there is something there that turns things on. So what we see, we reflect. And as we spend time with God, uh, we end up reflecting the glory of the Lord. As Moses did when he came down from the mountain, it's like he was that filled with God and that, uh, that <laughs> transformed not totally transformed, we saw later on because he has a bit of anger, but I mean, the whole glory just shone out of his face and it absolutely, absolutely scared the people. So it says here, more and more. You know, this is sequential. God does more and then a little bit later on, he does more again. There is always more and more. And friend, our quest to become like Christ is a lifelong quest and we never get there. And anybody that says, I have arrived. We know, no, you have not arrived. You're filled with pride. You think you're already there, so we know you're not there yet. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so more and more, spending time with God. It's a little bit like the processes of osmosis and diffusion. How many scientists do we have here this morning that understand this whole world? I don't. I'm not a scientist, but I can do a little bit of reading, and I remember some stuff that they taught us, you know, this osmosis when, uh, and, and diffusion. It just means that when we get close to God, His goodness flows into us, and whatever is in us that's not supposed to be there, He draws it out, and He takes it away. You know, they say with osmosis and diffusion that you can have a, a container of fluid with some solids inside, some solution of sorts, and you, 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 you cut this thing in half and put a, a membrane down the middle of those two different types of fluid with a, what they call a high concentration and a, a low concentration uh, and everything, and there's a, a flowing across from one to the other. They call it osmosis. Uh, and diffusion is another, depending on if you're dealing with different types of materials. As I say, it's all beyond my level of understanding, but it's like that, uh, that suddenly there is a drawing. Uh, when we get close to God, we are drawing the glory. It just happens. Uh, it just happens. Uh, and, and, and God draws things out of us. And I know that Moses had a bit more drawing out to be done because his anger cost him the entrance into the promised land. You know, anger will always cost us somewhere. Um, and in this instance, there was a fit, so Moses had to get back up the, on the mountain and say, all right, God, what was that again? And so this time he chiseled the stone tablets because the ones that God made, he smashed. And then a bit later on, they are, you know, the people are rising up again to, to play, and they're complaining because there's no water there. And God says to Moses, all right, Moses, because... Um, Moses talks to God, says, God, we've got a problem. The water is bitter, and the, the people are ready to kill me, and, and, and so forth. And God says, all right, Moses, uh, go out there and take the stick that you got in your hand and uh, point it to, the, to that rock, and water will come out. Well, earlier, God says to him, I want you to hit that rock, um, and water, and, and, and you know, something will come out. But this time, God says, point to it, point to it. Well, Moses is uh, getting out there, but he's still wild. You know, the people, they're 
people. So he gets out there. He smacks this rock. Whack, whack. He says, there you go, you rebels. He says, must I bring forth water from this rock? And water came out all right, despite his anger. You know, sometimes God does things despite of us rather than because of us. But then a bit later on, God says, Moses, you know, I wanted you to glorify me. And your anger didn't glorify me. Because you didn't point to the rock. You smacked it. You can't get into the promised land. He says, you will lead the people to the edge of it, but you can't go in. He says, bring Joshua and anoint him. He will be the leader that will take people in. And friend, in terms of you and I, who we want to be with our uh, passion, with our, you know, uh, different issues. Do you want to be a Moses or do you want to be a Joshua? Uh, you know, in terms of both of their good qualities, I want to be both of them. But as I say, we need to keep our passions and our anger under control because it will cost us somewhere. As I say, it cost Moses. God still loved him. But it cost him uh, all the pre-work that he had done only to miss out in the last moment to not be able to take the people in. Praise God. How many of you are excited this morning? I don't mean to depress you this morning. This is meant to be a positive message. <laughs> all right. Point number four. Moving quickly now. When life gets hard, remember the reward. When life gets hard, remember the reward. Please note the first word of this fourth point, it's when. It doesn't say if life gets hard, it says when it gets hard. Life will get hard. If it's not hard now, it will get hard somewhere. There will be hard parts and hard moments and stretches of the road that are harder than others. And when that happens, you know, there is a tendency in human nature to want to give up, like, oh, I want to give up, it's too hard. But it is in, during those times where it's important that we remember the word, the reward. And rewards in this life, but there's also rewards in the life to come. Stuff that we cannot even begin to imagine. Now, the, the word's got lots of uh, information in there in regards to what heaven's going to be like and uh, rewards that we can expect there, but we won't really know the fullness of it until we actually get there. Here in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2 and verse 3, and we're still here in Hebrews where, you know, the writer talks about, you know, running this race. It says, Jesus did not give up because of the cross. Have you know that the cross is probably the hardest thing that anybody could have to endure? He did not give up because of the cross. On the contrary, because of the joy that was waiting for him, he thought nothing of the disgrace of dying on the cross. And he's now seated at the right hand of God's throne. Think of what he went through. See, the cross wasn't just a physical pain issue. The very shame of hanging on a cross, which was a death reserved for the worst of criminals, Jesus had to endure. And he suffered spiritually, he suffered mentally, emotionally, and he suffered physically just in an unbelievable way. Number three, think of what he went through, verse three. How he put up with so much hatred from sinners. So do not let yourself become discouraged and give up. Well, do not let yourself become discouraged. Evidently, discouragement is a choice. And courage is a choice as well. That's why I like hanging out with encouraging people rather than discouraging people. Because there are people that will take courage out and there are other people that will put courage in. So we should spend time with encouraging people as much as possible. And if anywhere we spend time with discouraging, try to encourage them. But a person that's not encouraged themselves can, can't hardly encourage somebody else properly. So it's always good to keep the courage up. It says, do not give up. 1 Peter 5.10, and after you suffer for a while, God will give all grace, will make everything right. He will make you strong and support you and keep you from falling. He called you to share in his glory in Christ, a glory that will continue forever. So there's a deal here where, you know, there is some suffering that goes on in life. Now, we don't have to suffer sickness. We don't have to suffer poverty because God's made provision for that in His covenant with us. But there will be persecution and there will be tests going on in life. Not that God tests us as such, but life will test us. 
the kind of uh, stuff that goes on that will test our patience, that will test our resolve, it'll test uh, every fiber within us uh, uh, to see if we're really prepared to keep, it'll test our faith. So it says, when life gets hard, remember the reward. Romans 8, 17, and since we are his children, we are his heirs. In fact, together with Christ, we are heirs of God, uh, heirs of God's glory. It says, but if we are to share his glory, we must also share his suffering. If we share his glory, we must also share his suffering. And this is sometimes where people don't understand that whilst Jesus had the masses run after him, society had actually rejected him by and large and pushed him out. Fringe. This guy's not like us. And sometimes when we become Christians, we are not all that welcome in certain circles anymore because, oh, you know, I'm not sure if we, we want this and everything. So there's a, an aspect of uh, suffering that we go through as believers that Jesus already went through. And the Bible tells us here, if we want to share his glory, we also got to share his suffering, whatever that means, whatever that looks like. You know, Jesus says, uh, everybody must pick up their cross. Whatever that cross is, we've got to pick it up. We each have to carry our own cross. Certain challenges in life that, that are not entirely unique to humanity, but they could be unique to us if we were to compare ourselves with three, four, five other people. But we just got to deal with it and get on with it. Oh, is everybody right this morning? Yes. Praise God. By the way, this week's memory verse is Romans 8, 28. In all things, God works for the good of those who love him and who have been called according to his purpose. That's a good memory verse because sometimes we go through stuff and like, this is like, oh, this is hard, but even that will work out for good for me. If I do the right thing, keep my attitude right, keep going, put one foot in front of another and keep the rewards inside and keep on looking at Jesus who is the ultimate example of endurance to go through something that's just unbelievable. And he didn't give up. Point number five, join a team to run with me. You know, it's been said that, you know, each of us have our own race to run, but we're never called to run this race by ourselves. There's other people running their race, but when we run together, uh, it's, it, it, becomes, it becomes much more doable. I've done a little bit of running, not a great deal of late, but done a little bit of running. And sometimes I run by myself and it's okay. But when you're running with somebody else, there's, just, there's an extra spring in my step. There's just something about that. Running without a people. And there's a kind of a building accountability sort of a deal. Um, and uh, where you just, you can't give up because other people are running the same race and you just keep going. Um, and uh, so you join a team. Hebrews 10, uh, 10 verse 24, it says, uh, verse 25, let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds. Notice the word spur one another on. We spur ourselves on, but we also need to let other people spur us on, and we in turn spur other people on as well. So we all keep in the race, and we're all going to get to the goal at the end of the day. Um, you know, your small group, is the perfect team to run with. Um, and some of you have been in small groups before, and it's absolutely fantastic. You know what that looks like and what that, what that does and everything. But as I say, if you haven't been in a small group before and you're in one now, make every effort to stay in it because they're becoming your running mates. All right? They're the people that you run with together. And you can encourage each other. And that's what uh, the writer of the book of Hebrews is talking about here. He says, he says uh, verse 25, uh, he says, Not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another. Encouraging one another. And all the more as you see the day approaching. All the more. All the more. Do it, but all the more when you see the day approaching. And the word day is printed with capital D in my Bible, and that's not just any day, that's a special day. And it's reference to the day when Jesus Christ returns to the earth. And friends, we have never been this close to the second coming of Jesus Christ. It's obvious because every day it gets closer. But friends, we are very, very close. And as sin is running rampant in the world, and humanism is gripping, uh, you know, the, 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 the lives of people all around us, 
and they worked out a very clever way of communicating another gospel. Communicating a gospel without God and without Christ. Humanism. We can make this happen. We've become the loving ones. We've become the inclusive ones. We are the people that will bring peace to the earth. Don't be fooled by that. There's only one Prince of Peace, and his name is Jesus Christ. Only one Prince of Peace. There's no human being that will bring peace uh, to the... And, of course, the Antichrist will bring a sort of a peace that will last for three and a half years. And, of course, that gets into end-time teaching that we haven't got time for to do. But even he can't keep it together. So, you know, um, it, it's, like, uh, it's like all the more when you see that day approaching. So your running mates in your small group, they're the people that you make yourself accountable to. They're the people that you journey with. They're the people that you share your heart with. And they're the people that you don't just tell them the great testimonies. You also tell them your struggles. Say, Look, I'm struggling with this a little bit here. You know, living authentic lives before one another um, will help us to suddenly find out and say, oh, gosh, you know, I, th I, I thought I was the only one that's, you know, challenged in an area, and I'm, uh, now I'm hearing that you're challenged in, in an area as well. Well, friends, we've all got challenges, all right? There's challenges in every single life of one form or another. Point number six, uh, moving on quickly, remember God is cheering me on at every stage. You know, it's been said that when, uh, you know, kids uh, uh, enter races, um, and the parents are there on the sideline, you know, to cheer them on. The parents aren't just cheering them on when they get to the finishing line. The parents are cheering them on every step of the way. From the work, go, come on, come on, you can do it. Keep going, faster, faster, and just cheering on all the way. You know, if little, little Johnny or whatever, you know, little Mary, whatever the name is of a little one, f falls over and stumbles a bit, it's like, you don't say, gosh, what a stupid kid, you know, like, you know, you wouldn't say that. Say, come on, get up. <laughs> And, and uh, so God's like that. God's not like people that sometimes can be very harsh. Uh, our God's a good God and he cheers us on. You know, the Bible says the righteous man falls seven times, but he rises up again. Amen. The point is not how often have you fallen. The point is how often have you picked yourself up because that last time picking yourself up becomes the, the determining factor whether you get to the end or not. People say, oh, you know, so-and-so has had a bit of a history. I said, well, <laughs> God bless you. you got a history too. <laughs> Pick yourself up again. Keep going and let's encourage each other going forwards. I don't know where that one came from, but anyway. Philippians chapter 3, verse 12. I don't mean to say that I've already achieved these things or that I've already reached perfection. Here's Paul. If there were a super saint anywhere in the Bible or since then, it'd be Paul. He gets to the end of his life. He says, look, he says, I haven't quite arrived yet. He says, I have not, I have not reached perfection, but though he was pretty up there. I mean, gosh, you know, the stuff that Paul went through, your average guy would have collapsed, uh, you know, like, uh, you know, like uh, uh, dozens of times earlier when he went through all sorts of stuff. But he just, a guy to keep going uh, he says, but look, he says, I haven't achieved everything yet and I haven't re reached perfection. But he says, I press on to possess that perfection for which Christ Jesus possessed me. No, dear brothers and sisters, I have not achieved it, but I focus on one thing, forgetting the past. Gosh, we ought to stop right there and preach for an hour on that point alone, forgetting the past. Stop beating yourself up. Forget the past. And husband and wife, Forget your past. It's like, you know, like uh, some people got, you know, they say a memory like a horse. Uh, a horse apparently doesn't forget, and some people are like a horse. You know, they just, don't, they just won't let go. Let it go. At a certain point, you go, just let it go and, and move on. And by the way, I didn't call you horse this morning. I said some people are like a horse, okay, in case you're wondering, like, oh, gosh, you know, I went to church today, and the pastor called me a horse. No, 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 you're not a horse, all right? Some people got a memory like a horse. <laughs> it says, forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead. I press on. <laughs> Turn to the person next to you and say, I press on. Just tell him, I press on. <laughs> say, I've forgotten the past. To reach the end of the race 
and received a heavenly price for which God, through Jesus Christ, is calling us. Wow, that's a powerful scripture right there. We're pressing on. We've got something waiting for us. Friends, we've got heaven waiting for us. We've got Jesus waiting for us. We've got the angels waiting for us. They all want us to make it. They all want us to get there. Jesus died so we will get there. Number seven, second to last point, take every step with purpose. Don't waste any step or any energy. Be disciplined. You know, in any race, athletes are disciplined people, man. And depending on how, what, what sort of sport they're into and depending on where they want to go and what they want to do, the, 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 the high, you know, achievers, they're, they're just highly disciplined people. They just don't, they just, you know, they're just disciplined people. 1 Corinthians 9.25, Paul says, To win the contest, you must deny yourselves many things that will keep you from doing your best. An athlete goes to all the trouble just to win a blue ribbon or a silver cup, but we do it for a heavenly reward that never disappears. Friend, live your life with, eternal, with an eternal mindset. Don't just think temporary things. Don't just think what you can get in this life. Think in regards to what's there in eternity for you. Verse 26, so I run straight to the goal with purpose in every step. Underline the word purpose in every step. I fight to win. I'm not just shadow boxing or playing around. Friend, in the body of Christ, there's really no time to play around. This is not a game. This is the real deal. This is not the rehearsal for another life that, uh, you know, like that whole lie of reincarnation that you work your way up and you work your way back down again and everything. There's only one life. It is appointed unto man to die once and then judgment, the Bible says. We've only got one life to live, and this is it. Let's do the best we can. All right? Let's live it with purpose. Um, there's purpose in every step. Um, Hebrews 12, verse 12 and verse 13. Lift up your tired hands then and strengthen your trembling knees. Keep walking on straight paths so that the lame foot may not be disabled but instead be healed. So lift up those tired hands. Sometimes people in the back of their mind, you know, they see other people, how they worship God. They're all excited. They're, oh, I wish I could be like them. You don't know that their hands are very tired. They've just decided to lift them up. So I wish I could be excited as them. Well, they're making themselves be excited. Some, sometimes it comes natural. Other times you make yourself. Lift up those tired hands. Sometimes the last thing that I feel like doing, lifting up hands, to be really honest, but... We lift them up anyway. That's what, what the Word tells us to do. Lift up your tired hands. This is now time to worship God. Now is the time to worship. Let's enter in. He says, strengthen those trembling knees. If I had enough time to tell you the whole story about my climb up Mount Narahoe, you talk about trembling knees. I'm talking about shaking that everybody could see. My knees were like almost having fellowship. I was that exhausted. <laughs> and, uh, and while we were in the cloud, I was okay. But when the cloud cover ripped open and I was realizing I was hanging in the side of the mountain, she's pretty steep, looking up and looking down, and I'm in slippery boots uh, that I've lost a footing. It would have been hundreds of meters before I got to land anywhere. I was just absolutely terrified. Uh, he says, strengthen your trembling knees. Strengthen those knees. And for me, that's just in this instance there, I had my skis that I was carrying as well, which is kind of, you know, the other guys had the proper gears. They had a backpack. I just carried them under my arm, you know, sort of just dragging myself up as you do. And so I decided this is a good time to get into my skis. And so I put one foot into the binding, and now I had a proper footing. Um, and put the other one in, and now the trembling stopped because I was now confident. Um, now i got a hold, and sometimes you've got to just find a hold where you are. Just, just people feel I'm a bit slipping. A bit, find a hold somewhere, and that'll give you strength. And lift up those tired hands. Strengthen those trembling knees. Keep walking on the straight paths. You see, don't allow anybody to divert you into crooked paths. Crookedness will catch up with you somewhere. What we sow is what we reap. He says, otherwise, he says, you, that the lame foot may not be disabled. Uh, 
but instead be healed, disabled or dislocated. That people are, are sometimes, you know, get, get dislocated or disabled somewhere because they've been dabbling in crooked stuff. Get, get out of crookedness and do everything straight. Number eight, realize that God will finish what he started in you. You know, God started a good work in us, and he will also complete it. He will complete that which he started. You know, in the end, there's only so much we can do. And we don't do it in our own strength. We do it in the strength of the Holy Spirit. We do things by the grace of God. We, we, we are able to do the impossible. Um, yet we don't do it in our own strength. We do it with the strength that God gives us. But here is probably one of the more encouraging scriptures in the whole Bible. Here it is. Philippians chapter 1 verse 6. And I'm certain that God, who began the good work within you, will continue his work until it is finally finished. Aren't you glad about that? God started the work and God will complete it. God started it and God will complete it. God started a good work in you and God will complete it. The Bible says that Jesus is the author and the finisher of our faith. He started it, he will finish it. He will perfect it as it goes along. And yes, that whole process takes a bit of effort on our part, but in the end, it's all by the grace of God. And here's the good news, friend. Whatever I don't finish in my lifetime, God will finish it in an instant when Jesus returns. And that's what it tells us here in this scripture there in 1 John chapter 3, verse 2. Yes, dear friends, we are already God's children right now. And we can't even imagine what it'll be like later on. But we do know this, that when, we, when he comes, we will be like him. Some of us are somewhat like him. But when he comes, in an instant, we will be totally like him. Completely like him. So all the flaws, all the faults, Everything is in an instant taken out. You know, sometimes we deal with things and some things are a bit besetting and they take a while. And you know, God appreciates us making an effort to become more like Christ and then we have a bit of a slip up and everything. And God cheers us on anyway. Sometimes, you know, God's always gracious. People are not always gracious, but God's very gracious and everything. But we keep going, we keep going. But whatever we don't finish will be finished in an instant. The Bible says that Jesus is returning for a church without spot and without wrinkle. And you know, it's like somebody said once, uh, all the wrinkles ironed out, all the spots removed, uh, the whole thing dry cleaned, you know, all the, everything gone, and it'll be like that. So what we don't finish in our lifetime, God will finish in an instant. But of course, that's no excuse for us. Oh, well, if he sorts it all out, then I'll carry on living as I am. No, 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 no. God accepts us as we are, but then he loves us too much to leave us the way we are. He started the good work. He will also complete it. So long as we stay with the program, stay in the family. Uh, purpose number one, let God love you. Purpose number two, uh, call to belong. Get into the family and stay in the family. Purpose number three, call to become like Christ. In fact, right now, uh, I want to go back right to our opening scripture, which I seem to have skipped. Uh, it's in your outline. I want to finish with this. Uh, Romans chapter 8. The very first scripture that's in your outline, Romans chapter 8, verse 28. And we know that God causes everything to work together for the good to those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. For God knew his people in advance, and he chose them to become like his son, so that his son will be the firstborn amongst many brothers and sisters. You know, sometimes we kind of always figure out everything that we're supposed to do, but here's one of the main things. Become like Jesus. Become like Jesus. So we're called to become. And that's why we're ministering along these lines. And that's why Pastor Rick is writing all the stuff in the book. And that's why he's ministering in our small group environment there. Aren't those uh, uh, video segments so good? It's like, whoa, very good stuff, really. And we're just, we're just thrilled. So absolutely. Uh, in fact, we've come to the end of our message. Uh, let's just slow down for a moment. As we've been running along and... I feel like I've been racing. I'm trying to say as much as what I can with the time that we got allocated to us. But just allow the Spirit of God to just do a little work in each and every one of our hearts. And uh, so, so, my friend, what's the next step for you? Uh, you know, as we said before, 
you know, as I said, this claim a friend of mine is just put one step in front of another. What's the next step for you? What, what, what does that look like for you? And are you prepared to take that step towards greater maturity, towards greater involvement uh, in, in the body of Christ, towards fulfilling your function? Um, what's the next step for you? Um, and who are you running with? Who, who are your running mates? You need to be able to identify who your running mates are. Um, I just communicated with a minister friend of mine, uh, and uh, we have been, in some sense, Pastor Vanessa and I have been running with these people for many, many years now. They knew us, and we knew them in the early days, and, and we don't always have a great deal of interaction on a day-to-day -day basis, but uh, we, we are in touch, and they're still running, and we are encouraged by their endurance, and we're still running. And you know, who are your running mates? Uh, but as I say, people in your small group is, 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 is uh, without a doubt the best system that God has instituted. See, Jesus surrounded himself with 12 people, 12 disciples, 12 apostles, people that became apostles. He picked them from where they came from, uh, fishermen, uh, tax collectors uh, that were considered the scum of the earth and, you know, others and everything else. He gathered them all together and they all started to become like Christ. As they hung out with him, they all started to become like Christ. So who are your running mates? Make a decision. Join in. And it's not too late to join a small group even now. We've still got some of them. We've got some of them that are closed. Uh, uh, there's already enough people there that we can sort of... Uh, that we can accommodate in terms of the physical space and everything else and a couple of other groups that we have going, family groups, but there's other groups that are still open, not too late. I encourage you to jump on board. God's really doing something, friends. We're in the last days. Let's make our life count. This is not the time to dawdle. This is not the time to take detours and to be out and about. This is the time to be in the house and let God do what he wants to do. Father, I pray for my brothers and sisters, for every single person that's here this morning. Lord, touch of all, uh, all of our lives. Fill us afresh with your spirit. Lord, give us a glimpse, uh, Lord, of what the rewards look like in the future, that if anybody's life is hard right now, Lord, they can endure hardship and still walk on with joy because Jesus, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross. And Lord, we want to walk with joy. And we thank you, Father, that you're helping us to help other people so we can all help each other to reach the goal. In Jesus' name, amen.